Welcome everybody. So I'm Brian. Um, I'm, I'm Brian Woodfield. I'm a professor of chemistry at Brigham Young University. And um, if uh, I'm not an organic chemist, so I apologize to the organic chemists. I do know a little bit um, enough to get around into the organic lab, but I'm generally a, a materials chemist and I uh, do research in physics and chemistry. So I teach general chemistry. Um, so I'm the uh, developer of the virtual labs. Heather, she introduced to some of you. She was um, a student back at BYU um, years ago and helped me develop the physics lab. And um, she's in charge of our content. And uh, she was a high school teacher and got her master's degree at Columbia Teaching College. Um, so she's helping with um, with us on our Beyond Labs project. So these virtual labs were developed um, at BYU over almost two decades, and uh, they've gone through a lot of different iterations over the years. They used to be sold by Pearson, and I don't know, two, three years ago, we pulled the licenses back from Pearson um, for various reasons, and we started Beyond Labs this last year, and we've been updating and and um, um, making the labs available again and more easily accessible to people. So, um, so that's where we're at. Um, so we have uh, labs for chemistry, organic, physics, and biology, and physical science. So what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna spend just a little bit of time on how we deliver the labs and about the client. And, um, and then talk about licenses and a little bit how to get into it. And then after that, um, I'm gonna start with physics this time um, and go to organic chemistry and end up with general chemistry. Um, so this will be, I'm willing to stay on as long as you guys want me to. Um, I um, will by necessity have to be kind of a, a general overview of what are the labs. I can't go to all the lab benches and show how they all work but I think you'll get a feel for how to, how to maneuver inside of them and how to do the different um, experiments. Um, so if you have questions, just um, it's probably best to just ask them to Heather on the chat, on, on the message or chat board here, and um, she'll interrupt me if there's anything that I should discuss before I go on to the next topic. So um, I'm going to share here. And um, so I'm going to go share and so um, and just kind of get started. So this is our client. This is a, um, something new that we developed over the last year as a way to manage and deliver the, um, the labs. And so this works on Macintosh and Windows. We do have a Chromebook version of general chemistry only at this point. We have a beta version for physics. Um, if you are a high school, an enterprise, a Google enterprise for school type of institution where you're managing Chromebooks, we can deliver Android apps to you, which you can then make available to your students. But Chromebook really isn't available yet on, on an individual basis. Um, and so mostly what I'm going to be talking about today is Macintosh and Windows versions that most people can get access to through one way or another. So this is the client, you download it from our site, it's free, you download it, and once you install it, there is a two day free license that you can start playing around and get access to everything. Um, so I have all my labs installed here, but what you would do is you would see a download button and then you would download the labs that you want access to. Um, so you click and then clicking open will open the lab that you want. So this is where we go to get into the labs themselves. Notice here that it has high school, higher ed. We have different levels. That doesn't change the lab at all. It just changes what lab activities are available. So lab activities are available in this tab called worksheets. And so we're divided into the different products. So if you go into chemistry, for example, you would see a high school set of worksheets and a higher ed set. Um, if you go into physics, you would see high school and higher ed, 
high school worksheets are divided into NGSS um, categories. Higher ed is more typical by the subjects that are normally taught in the order that they're taught. So, um, so if you go into say higher ed here, you would see worksheets for kinematics, forces, circular motion, and, and so on. Um, and so um, let me just go back, kind of show you something like in chemistry. So for in higher ed in chemistry, you may want to say, hey, I want to do a titration. So here's acid-base chemistry. And here's a list of a wide variety from really low level, highly structured activities to unknowns and high level ones where we don't give a lot of instructions. And so what you would do is just click on this worksheet and it brings up a PDF file with step-by-step -step instructions. These worksheets are a gr great way to learn how to use the, the software, how to use the labs, because we give you step-by-step -step instructions with these assessments. So this one is really high end. We just, we don't give a lot of instructions here, essentially give them an unknown and have them report what the unknown is. Um, and so this is kind of how the worksheets are. We have word versions of these if you want access so that you can modify and make and create your own. You don't have to use these in here. You can download them and make them available on your LMS systems. This is just where we house them so they're easily accessible. This is the license tab. Um, and so for first two days, that's free. Um, and then after that, you would need to get an activation code. So um, we sell activation codes to students directly on our website for $25, or we sell a, a group code. So one code that works for X number of uses that we give to you. And then the students would just enter that code here and then submit it to activate the product. And that's where it goes. And finally, this is settings. So this is where you can change the level. Don't click this button. You just make the click and it really configures the lab for the different levels. And I'll show you how that works when we get into a lab. So this is how the client works. It's just uh, access point controls licenses and note, you know, note how these uh, worksheets are, are organized because changing the level is what um, makes them available to, makes changes that configuration inside the lab. So that's the client. I mean, once it gets installed, um, it's, it's, just an, it's just the access point for the labs. So, so as promised, let's start with physics um, since we usually start with chemistry and and uh, we'll spend some time in physics. So, um, so, the, I, so this is the landing page that uh, you get for physics. And um, it um, is divided into these different lab benches. Now, I won't be able to show you all of these lab benches, um, but each one of these is an open-ended experiment. So for example, if I were to go into the circuit lab, um, I click there and it brings me to circuits and here's this lab bench and we can and it's like a real lab bench. So a whole idea is to allow open endedness, allow students to do whatever they would do in a real lab. And then the lab activities are where we provide the structure and the level appropriate activities. So you can do basic really basic experiments here, or you can do algebra-based or calculus-based experiments, and, um, <clears throat> and, and uh, just based on the actual level of the instructions you provide, just like in a real lab. So I'm not gonna go do this one yet, but this is kind of show you how it works. And then this, I've got this set to higher red level. It can be set to the high school level. This is what changes when you change a different level. None of this stuff changes just like it's in a real lab. So this is where you would um, be able to um, um, correlate to those lab activities. So each of the lab activities has some type of preset. Um, and so these presets then correspond to those lab activities. And so we have the same organization in the worksheets as we do here. So if you were to do a concave mirror, experiment, for example, um, then you would click on this, that would bring us to the 
optics lab, and then you would see a virtual eye. This is the angle it's at. This is the concave mirror. That's the um, angle that it's set at. You could click here and change the radius of the curvature or make it flat. And then this is the object, which is uh, a candle. And so what you would be seeing here is what the real image would be. Auto focus is on and you can do various experiments. So this is the optics lab and you can do filters and mirrors and lenses and any number of them. And um, we also have clipboards that you'll see throughout the labs, which also has other presets. So here's a concave mirror between this uh, center and the focal point. You know, here's one um, at the center of curvature and so on. So um, different objects, we have lasers, prisms and so these are the these are the experiments and how they would work so this is kind of how it works lab activities you assign it drop it in don't have to do anything tell the student to do one of them they come here they find it they click the lab is preset they follow the instructions answer the assessments and and then there's various ways of reporting back to you for these pdfs um, they can print it out, write on it, take a picture, make a PDF and upload it to you. Some, um, some instructors, they just say, hey, create me a Google Doc and just um, do screen capture. So for example, if I were to go back to this uh, concave mirror one, you know, do a, um, you know, come over here and do a screen capture of that image and then have it go put it in your google doc and go write about why it's that way or and answer their questions so lots of different ways to get the answers back to you we also have we also have this electronic lab book where they can come over here and click save come back and open it and then you can see what that object is as well which they can come in then as save as an external file um, and so i'm going to save that and then it gets saved as a file up on wherever they want, which they can upload to you as well. So multiple routes to collect what the student is doing, um, but it's all kind of geared around, um, you know, what we would do in a real lab. Same idea, the lab books, worksheets, reports, lots of different ways that are all in pedagogically valid, and that's how they would go. So kind of showing you circuits, Circuits, you can build any circuit up to 35 components, inductors, capacitors, resistors, light bulbs, function generators, and oscilloscopes. So um, these, these benches here are in the general chemistry lab as well, the quantum mechanics, spectroscopy, calorimetry, and gases. But for physics, I really want to, I really want to focus on on uh, mechanics here because this is where most of the are a good chunk of your class is going to use the labs so years ago in another lifetime for me i taught a physics class at a small liberal arts college before i came to byu and when i was trying to develop experiments for the students to do it was always frustrating that i couldn't control gravity and i couldn't get rid of friction and so the whole idea is I wish that I had control over all the variables. And so that's why we created this lab. So this lab is we have different gravities in different directions, which we can control their size. We have forces like a plunger and we have a rocket. We have different kinds of friction, depends on the experiments. We have ramp motion, we have a ball, buckets of balls, we have a sled, we even have a rod, and then we have solar systems. So you can pretty much mix and match and do all kinds of different experiments here. So, you know, for example, something really simple. What if I wanted a ball with downward gravity and I wanna be able to add air friction and um, maybe I also want to add a plunger you know, what kind of experiments could I explore just with those simple types of objects? So I would click on my experiment table, and here I have a virtual table, but that's a 2D, 2D motion table, and um, I can control my units, I can control my coordinate systems if I want, I can control my time scale, 
I can control forces, reset, and I even have this really cool parameters palette here where I can control what the ball is made of, the diameter, the mass, where the mass is distributed. For frictions, I have air resistance so I can control the barometric pressure or the altitude. Um, for the forces, I can specify what the, what the, um, what the uh, forces and newtons or whatever units they specify. And um, so also here for gravity, we can specify which planet you're on or specify the gravity with the number. So you have control over all this. You can also record all of this data so students can export it and graph it and talk about it and analyze it. So here's a simple sequence of experiments that qualitative or quantitative that you could do with your students. I drag a ball out here and everyone's gonna think it's going to fall because that's what we're used to. But if I click start, nothing happens because I don't have any forces on it. So I can reset. Um, notice that down here is the position, velocity, the accelerations, momentum. Now if I go add gravity and I click start, now it falls. But now students can start looking at it and say, wow, well, this guy's, the velocity is going through the roof, acceleration's constant, but that's not what they experience here. Um, and so what we can do here is reset that and now throw in air friction and click start. And now you see that the acceleration changes and that we're gonna reach a terminal velocity. And now they can start playing around with, well, what happens if I change the mass? What happens if I change the radius? And, and see how the frictions affect its motion. So simple qualitative explorations, but you could also take this data and do a quantitative and graph it and see how it changes. So lots of, lots of different types of experiments you could do here. I'm gonna put my um, um, air friction back. Now I'm gonna go put a plunger and um, I'm going to actually launch it. So I actually did this for my kids when they had those rocket and took, took physics in high school and they had the, the, the rockets and they had to calculate the angle and predict where it was going to hit. We actually did this here and actually predicted what angle they needed it and actually hit the bullseye is that you could change the size of your ball here to mimic what the size of the rocket is and actually go do this. And so, um, so here I'm going to click force and launch it. So now I see that I get 2D motion and I can uh, have, have that keep on going. But now what I can do is say, what happens if I have air friction and um, do that as well? Click force and um, plot or, or take the data and see how it changes. So all of these different experiments that you could do and um, of course, it's always better to have students. I mean, it's always good to have students build an experiment and know what it's like to actually do these measurements. And when I'm, I'm all about doing real experiments, my point of the virtual labs is that it's a tool that you can add to the real experiments so students can control variables and design experiments before they do the real lab or extend real labs into more complicated experiments doing this. And of course, in our day and age, where we're all stuck at home, you know, this is a suitable replacement until we get back out to the real world again. So um, I'm going to return all these items. So we've had a bunch of people asking, can you spend more time showing the lab book, showing how that what that data looks like, especially here in physics as you're generating data tables? Can you show what the data looks like so then students could export it and use it to do sure. data analysis? So Let's go. So I have like this clipboard and I have a preset where this experiment's already done. And I'm going to click force. And what I would do is click record here. And then I would click force. And um, this in this preset, I have it stopping once it, um, once it hits the edge there. And so it stopped recording. Then what I would do is come back to the lab book and here's my data. It's a link. And then here is time, position, x and y position, velocity, vx, vy, and so on, saved for all that data. And what you could do is then 
copy that data and then um, paste it into a spreadsheet. So, um, so. And you can also have students select which of the data they want to save. Like if you're just making a velocity graph or a position right. graph, they can just save that. There's ways to, to select and control what you data you save. So there's all that data. Now they can start doing graphs or start doing calculations. So for example, um, maybe you wanted them to calculate this. So you could, and the presets kind of do this sometimes as well, is you can unselect what's being saved here and just have them save certain data and then have them teach them how to do the calculations of what the velocity would be or how to integrate it back, depending on if it's algebra-based or calculus-based or whatever you're trying to do here. But you don't even have to do it quantitatively. You could do it qualitatively for a physical science class and just have them see that motion. We also have an option here that if I reset this, I can click on trails and um, the dots are really small. You probably can't see it on the resolution here, but you can actually track that motion across the screen and have them look, look, look what it's like. So all of the experiments let you collect the data and let you analyze it. So here's a bucket, what we call buckets of ball, a bucket of balls. So we have here is, this is just a preset, but you can move these balls anywhere you want, position them, put a plunger, you can change the elasticity, you can change, so right now we have rolling friction, so you can control what the materials are, what's the object made of, what's the surface made of, change the friction coefficient, and then you can click here and click force, and then all of this data. So we're just tracking the data for ball number 10, but if I were to save this data, I would save the positions for all the balls and their momentum and so on and be able to work that. So, I mean, Heather even put together this beautiful uh, preset experiment for one of our lab activities where we're talking about the motion of solids. So kinetic theory, kinetic motion of, of molecules and restrict these balls within the size so they can't move. And, and so there's lots of, lots of things you could do. Um, okay, Brian, we've got a couple people asking, let's switch over to chemistry and bio. And they'd like to also see um, the data that is saved within chemistry, what type of data is saved there. Okay, just wanna point out that you have solar system motion, Halley's Comet, oscillating motion, you've got all kinds of things that you can explore on this one as, as well. So we'll just exit. And um, so I'm not gonna save my lab book right now, but I could, um, but that's, so here's what that lab book that I saved earlier would be. So um, let's um, get out of that. So let's go to organic chemistry first, um, and then we'll go to general. So same idea, lab benches, each lab bench is completely open-ended. Worksheets over here with presets. There's a lab book. Don't forget help files. Nobody really reads them, but they're all there. They're pretty detailed on how to use everything. Organic chemistry is divided into synthesis and qualitative analysis, all right? So the synthesis lab is probably our most procedural lab in that there's a sequence of events that you need to go through in order to actually make a product. So the whole idea here in synthesis is, I wanna make a target compound, how do I pick how do I do that? What's the right starting materials? What's the right conditions? What's the right reagents? And how do I prove that I actually made what I think I made? And so the way this lab works is you pick one of these um, reactions. So these are named reactions which define a set of starting materials. Now, you don't have to do the reaction. You don't have to do a alkyl halide solvolysis just because you pick these, these just pick a set of starting materials. So if I pick a sterification, it picks these starting materials and that's what the structures are that you saw were what starting materials you're gonna get. So once I do that, I'm not restricted to doing a sterification reaction. I can pick zero, one or two of these um, starting materials and a solvent and put it into this round bottom. So, any order, so I'm gonna pick this alcohol, I'm gonna add it, I'm going to pick this solid um, acid, I'm gonna add it, I could pick a solvent or not. Um, 
Now I'm going to drag it over here to my stir plate and that closes the stock room. Now I need to pick um, one of my reagents or I don't even have to pick a reagent. So we're going to have an outcome on whatever, whatever decision the student makes. We'll have an outcome and, it's, and it will be a real outcome. It will be the actual outcome of what would happen. So in this particular one, I want sulfuric acid. So I'm going to go add the acid. And the chalkboard kind of shows what's in it. Um, and then I now can start it by clicking my start button, or I can go <clears throat> build my setup and say, hey, I want to heat this one. So I'm going to need a condenser. I'm going to want to add my heater. But if they don't, we'll have an outcome. So it might blow up if they do it wrong, or the reaction might take forever if they do it wrong. We also have ice to slow it down. We also have nitrogen, so I need to add my nitrogen. Otherwise, this one would blow up and just animation of it blowing up. So I have my acid, I have my heat, condenser, nitrogen. So I'm going to click start and my reaction starts. I could use my clock on the wall to advance time, but now I want to go measure TLC to go measure the extent of the reaction. So this is my starting material lane, but this is the product mixture lane. So I'm starting to get product already. I can save that to my lab book. Now I'm going to say, well, let's go guess. I'm going to go advance 20 minutes. How far did the reaction go in 20 minutes? Now students could easily just dial up four hours and be done with it, but that wouldn't be the right answer because we always ask them, how long does it take for this reaction to run? And they actually have to do it systematically to go figure that out. We use first or second order kinetics as appropriate for the different reactions. And we use experimental rate constants. So the reactions actually take um, as long as they should in the lab. We also have the um, um, Arrhenius constant. So we know what the temperature dependence is, whether we're re reacting under ice, room temperature, or heat, or at the solvent temperature, or the reaction mixing temperature. So all of this is there. I can save that. Now I'm going to go advance another 10 minutes and go do a reaction mixture. And sure enough, I'm done. I, add, I added five minutes because it takes five minutes to do a TLC. And so there I am. I'm done. I'm going to save that. I could open my lab book and say, you know, this is my time. So this was 35 minutes. Um, put that in my lab book. Now I need to work it up. So I'm going to grab my SEP funnel. Here's my SEP funnel. So now I have my product mixture. Now I can choose one of these three aqueous reagents. Pick the right one. Acid base doesn't matter on this particular case. You can do countercurrent extractions. I'm going to go add my water. Now I have my organic layer. And I'm going to pull out. Um, my organic layer. Notice that my diethyl ether left um, as part of that mixing step, uh, as part of that workup step, because I, it goes through a rotovap. Now I have my product. Now I have to prove it. Now, obviously, the chalkboard says what it is, but the students need to prove it. So I'm going to grab my um, NMR tube from my proton NMR, and I'm going to show them a real a real spectra of what's there. These numbers are number, number the peaks, and then down here are the integrations. And they have to use to integrate how many protons are associated with each peak. They can save that to their lab book, say OK. If you want to, if you're doing an advanced lab, you can do carbon-13. So we're going to go down here and do a carbon-13 as well. Um, you can do mass spec. So all of these are real spectra we acquired from Sigma. Um, so save that, and I can do FTIR, and here's the FTIR spectra. So save that, and now the students need to go through and identify peaks and use the spectra to prove what they made is really what they made. So this is synthesis, right? So here's the lab book. Here's all that information that we saved to it. Um, and um, students, again, you don't have to use them. They can save these lab books, upload them to you, and view them, or have the TAs view them. Or you can just have them do a report, do screen captures, put them in the report. Lots of different ways of doing it. We also have worksheets for here where we have 
about 120 different targets um, for students to try to make, but that's only a small, small fraction of the, of the different materials that we can make here. So I know that there's general chemistry waiting, but I need to show you the qual side really quickly. Um, so in the qualitative analysis side, the idea is identifying, um, identifying different functional groups and how to use wet chemical tests and your spectra to identify compounds. So if I mouse over one of these, what I'm going to show is what known compounds. So if I click aldehydes, I'm going to show you four bottles that contain an aldehyde. And these are known so a student can practice knowing what they should expect. Okay. And then we have here an unknown, like unknown number 210. All right. So we have instructor manuals for all of our worksheets that give you the, unknown, the answers to all the unknowns and answers, answers to all of the questions. And, um, and so a student could take one of these. So if I take this, drag it to the round bottom, and uh, drag it to my cork ring, and now says unknown 200, 210. I give them the boiling point, percent carbon, percent hydrogen. If they want melting point, we have a melting point apparatus here if it was a solid. So now we can do the same thing. Go do the spectra and save that to their lab book and do all of the spectra. But now we can also do wet chemical tests. So if I take this, take an aliquot, and now I can go through and do a Jones oxidation. Um, so I show a real picture or a video of a Jones oxidation to see if it's positive or negative. So this happens to be positive. So our worksheets have these unknowns. We have them go through, do the spectra. We have them go through and do um, report positive, negative tests for all the wet chemical tests. And then what they would do is report what they have, and then you would grade them manually based on, on their unknown number. Um, I'm going to click on my disposal bucket. We also have another set of, well, the same set of unknowns, but we can give them these unknowns through the clipboard here. So somebody emailed me just this morning and, um, um, you know, about natural products. We have natural product, a few natural product unknowns, but I can come over here and click on aldehydes and produce an unknown, but this one isn't numbered. So we worried about the numbered unknowns that eventually students figure out what they are and they publicize that. So here's a way of giving an unknown where they have no idea what it is. And they go through and do the same tests, same spectra. But what they would do is go to the lab book and then they would click on report and then they would type in um, my, my um, answer and then click submit. And so this records in their lab book, their answer and the real answer, the systematic name and the common name. And then they would save this, save the file, um, save it, I'm gonna replace it over that. And then they can take that file and upload it um, to your LMS. And then you or the TA just open these things using the open command here to, um, to open all of that data back up and look at their answers and grid them. So any questions about organic before I get started with general chemistry? So there were two questions we haven't gotten to about teaching procedures. Um, so if there was a question from Don about is there a module that teaches techniques as well as fractional distillation, recrystallization. And then there was also a question about um, background on techniques like NMR and TLC, that would be in the in the help menu too. Um, so we assume that teaching how to use and how to interpret NMR is going to be done in the course or in a textbook. So we're not teaching them how to interpret the NMR. So that's not included in help. Although the intent of the qualitative analysis really isn't. Well, I guess I'm old fashioned. I mean, I'm, I'm old fashioned because I like qualitative analysis, both the inorganic and the organic, but I'm also modern in the sense that I know that we don't really use those techniques in the real lab, but from a pedagogical instructional standpoint, 
um, doing, doing these is a great way for students to learn how to interpret their spectra. So the whole purpose of the qual part in organic was to force students to interpret lots of spectra without having what the answer is. So we have like 300 unknowns and you know we have over almost 800 spectra available so there's lots of practice that they could do but teaching them how to do it per se no um, and also when it comes to answering about technique you know um, I, I, I'm going to give you the two minute answer and not the 30 second one um, you know um, so my father was one of the pioneers in software. He was actually um, uh, chief, chief uh, software engineer for Apollo. And dinner table conversation at my house was how to write code. That's why I wanted to become a chemist instead of a, a CS person like my brothers. And, um, and so he always taught that, you know, a computer is only a tool. People try to make it do things that it's not good for and people also forget that what it is good for and don't don't program it to do it so the whole idea behind the virtual labs is to do things that we can't do in a real lab it's not to replace a real lab it's to augment a real lab so the idea is to help provide an environment for students to do things that we can't let them do which is make mistakes we can't let them experiment or design their own experiments for the most part because we don't have the time or the cost or the or the safety issues and so so the answer about technique it really isn't good for teaching technique for the most part titrations yeah maybe you know calorimetry maybe a little bit but but it's really about decision making open-endedness and looking at results and then diagnosing and understanding results so that it teaches us how to be it's really trying to teach students how to think like a scientist. So, so organic does have a distillation apparatus, so you can distill a product, but it's really not going to teach you how. Although we do separate and we do um, do distillations to separate mixtures of solids and liquids as long as the melting point is low enough. So, we do have that. We do have a recrystallization as well, but there's really no te no technique involved. Anything else, Heather? Sorry, I wouldn't let me un unmute. Um, Arlene was wondering about qual without spectral analysis, and I was just about to type all those, those tests on the counter. Students can learn all of the different types of, of tests that students can do, just with the wet tests. Yeah. Um, that's the other way that we often uh -huh. do our qual. Yeah, so you can just do the wet, have them do the wet tests only, or have them do spectroscopy only. Um, it's up to you. I mean, our worksheets assume both, but again, you're, you're perfectly free to write your own. I mean, it's, I mean our, if you've seen our model here, it's like a real lab. You open an instructional lab, it's got stock rooms, it's got benches, it's got drawers full of equipment, but no one tells the student what to do until we as the instructors tell them to do it. And so we have some preset stuff that we include with the product, the lab activities, but, but you know, the, the reason that there's no major sellers on lab manuals is because every school does it their own way. And so we provide a good starting point, but we hope that you will develop what you want on your own to customize it for your school and your students. All right, let's go do the general chemistry. Um, so, um, so general chemistry, same thing, work, here's the different benches. So we had the quantum, the gases, calorimetry that was in physics, uh, but we also have titration experiments and inorganic experiments. Same thing with worksheets. We have high school level worksheets and we have higher ed slash AP level worksheets as well, all accessible to you. All you have to do is change the level. Um, now, I think it's um, kind of important here to to kind of distinguish the different tap types of lab benches we've created. And these three over here, titrations, calorimetry, and inorganic, are really what I would call high fidelity reproductions of experiments you would do in a real, could do or would do in a real lab. 
gases and quantum mechanics are lab experiments that are real, but you wouldn't normally do them just because it's equipment, you don't have the equipment, it's difficult or it's dangerous. So, so this quantum mechanics may not be experiments you would be replacing right now, but there are some really cool experiments here um, that we have tied into atomic theory. So we really have all the classic historical experiments that were done that helped us understand atomic theory. So the whole reason we made this lab, this particular lab bench, was because we talk about these experiments in our textbooks, like Rutherford, but we, the students never do them and never understand how we came to those conclusions. So Rutherford is a classic, okay? So if I click Rutherford here, we tell them what Rutherford did and they can regurgitate on a test. Rutherford's experiment told us that the atom is mostly empty space, but we don't tell them how he came to that conclusion. So, um, so in this one, you know, we have here is an alpha particle source. We have a gold foil and we have a phosphor screen. So I can turn on my phosphor screen and um, move that over here so you can see it. And so they can see what happens as alpha particles go through gold foil and, and are detected here on the phosphor screen. So it's open-ended. What happens if I remove the gold foil? Then I get a little spot. What happens if I close my shutter here? Then I get nothing. Open it back up and I get it. What happens if I move my phosphor screen to the left? I don't see my column of alpha particles coming over. What if I put my gold foil here and sure enough, I start seeing alpha particle deflections at a wide angle. So this is real data. This isn't just some, some um, you know, modeled stuff just to qualitative. This is actual real data, backscattering statistics based on the thickness of our gold foil and the number of alpha particles coming out. And so we can show them that, you know, that this big fat spot in the middle is caused by most of them going through, the, most of the alpha particles going through and not being deflected, but some are. And then they can move them over here. And um, move this thing out of the way. And then I can say where they hit with the persist mode and start counting statistics. Here's one, here's one down there, there's one. And so you can teach them these experiments, still qualitative, you know, it can be quantitative, but it's qualitative. And um, that's just how it is. So here's our stock room for, for this experiment. Let me clean up our lab bench here, come back in here. And so we have lasers and electrons and light bulbs and different detectors like spectrometers and video cameras, oil mist for millikan. And again, we have a clipboard with all these different presets. So here's a millikan experiment, all right? I can now change my electric field and move my oil drops around and measure the charge of an electron. I can come over here to um, Thompson. I can do a two slit diffraction. I can change the wavelength of my laser or I can come back here and I can change the slit spacing and see how that changes. And I can change how many photons are coming out and build up diffraction and to build up diffraction patterns and talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I can do the same thing with electrons. So two slit diffraction with electrons and show wave particle duality. So we have worksheets that are level appropriate for high school or higher ed that step students through these. So I just wanted to show you quantum mechanics. It's really unique. It's, um, and it really does do a powerful job of, of, um, of, of teaching and helping students believe, you know, from, from my perspective, it's like I'm converting them to quantum mechanics that they can actually believe it without just having to trust us that it's, that it's true. So here's our inorganic lab. So this is the, actually the first lab that we made. Um, this is version four of it. Um, and um, this is how it works. So, so this again shows you a lab that would be a, a, a duplicate, a, a reproduction of something you would do. 
So the idea for this came when I was a grad student at Berkeley and I was teaching Chem 1A and students were doing qual and they were absolutely learning nothing out of the whole experiment because they were just following cookbooking their way through and not even caring about the reactions or why or the logic behind a qual scheme. And so I thought that this was an example of where a computer would be more powerful than in, than in real life because I could allow them to do experiments without giving them all the instructions. So in this one, I would take a test tube, drag it, put it on my holder, and I show a real picture of what's in it, which is empty. I can then take any of these cations, I can add them by clicking any order, any combination that I want, up to 26 of them, and I'm gonna show a real picture and show them what's in it. Then I have these lab manipulations. I can centrifuge it, I can do a flame test. So we show a real flame test here or a flame test with a cobalt filter. I can, I can decant it, I can divide, I can heat it up, I can measure the pH of the solution, pH of the vapor, I can smell it with my nose, I can stir it, and I can add any of these 11 reagents, any order, any combination that I want, and we're gonna show you the real outcome. So it took us two years of some students, four students working two years um, doing all the permutations to create the real database. So these are actual experimental results and not predicted from solubility tables because kinetics actually comes into play for many of these. So here's an example of what I could do. I could add go to pH 7 or I could go to pH 10 and I show a real picture. Everything here precipitates out. I could go to sodium hydroxide. Now my chromium is in solution because it's amphoteric. I can centrifuge that, then I could decant. Um, and um, now I have my chromium. Notice that I added sodium because I added sodium hydroxide. So sodium is there. So if I were some unsuspecting student were to add it and then decide to do a flame test, you know, they would just see the sodium flame masking everything. All right, so I could, um, drag this and replace it. You can label your test tubes. So how would I separate those? I could add ammonia. I could centrifuge that and then decant. So now I see the good blue from the copper amine. Now I can go to pH 10 and say, hey, I have copper, but I can also add carbonate as a confirmatory. So they could do a scheme and you can create unknowns here, just like in the qual for organic, you can create um, practice unknown. So I can come over here and say I want a minimum of zero to a maximum of three for cobalt, chromium, copper, and then I can create my unknown. So here's an unknown. I'm going to drag this out of the way, put this in here. Now there's an unknown. Um, so I could go through and do my test. So I can go sodium hydroxide, but, and centrifuge that, I know I don't have chromium, add my ammonia, centrifuge that, I know what I have, go to my lab book. I've done this test a few times, so I'm pretty fast. So no chromium, I have cobalt, copper, submit. Now there's a practice unknown, so the students can practice. And then what we have here is, again, in our clipboard, we have a series of basic unknowns that are numbered unknowns, or we have some um, advanced unknowns right here that are more complicated that um, then get reported in their lab book in the same way. So I can submit that and see that I only got one right. So that's the inorganic lab. Questions about that one? I haven't seen too many questions on this. Feel free to chime and unmute yourself. Do you have any questions, anyone? So here's titration. Um, so drawers full of beakers, pipettes, analytical balance. There's your burette. We have conductivity meter. I mean, a conductivity meter, a pH meter. And then we have, you can do oxidation reduction titrations, or you can do acid base. You could titrate any acid with any base or any acid with any acid or any base with any base. 
and we're going to calculate the pH of it. You have solids and solutions. And so if I wanted to do an acetic acid titration like vinegar, then I can come over here with sodium hydroxide, come back here. Here's my beaker. I can come add my some acetic acid and then double click, add my 25 mils. And um, then now, I've, now I know how much I have. Um, and so, um, so I need to move my beaker here. Let's open this back up again. And so I, you know, if I wanted to, I could just add it um, and go through this whole process. But we can also, you know, again, I'm just going to show you really quickly in the interest of time is do, do these different presets. So here's a weak acid, strong base preset. So here I've already added the acetic acid. It's unknown number four, sodium hydroxide. There's its, um, there's its concentration. And I can save this data by clicking save and I can start my titration here. So we start so graphing. Add indicator. What'd you say? Uh, you may want to add indicator. Oh yes. So this one had an indicator added already, the phenyl failing. Oh. But right. yes, but we have eight different indicators, and you can also open a chart, show them where they change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, no. Yeah, this preset just has it all set up. This is a preset where we would just focus on the elements of what a titration is and then have another, and then have them maybe set it up manually on another experiment or on another thing. So show them what the titration curves, why the conductivity changes. And so there's my indicator changing. I can stop my recording, open my lab book, and there's my pH data that they can copy and analyze. So um, just so you know, you know, it depends if you like you're an advanced class. So right now you can do this really basic, but we introduce glassware airs into the pipettes and the burettes so that they, um, they don't deliver exactly like they say. Um, so we make them read it manually so it's painful, like in a real lab. Um, so, so we have glassware airs and they could, they could wait, they could deliver water and calibrate your pipettes or your glassware, they could, um, we also have buoyancy corrections on the balance, so they're observed masses and not true masses. Here's the barometric pressure that you need to do those corrections. So, um, so we've got a few minutes. Let me just show you what can happen in, in calorimetry. Um, so here we have a bomb calorimeter to so measure heats of combustion, heats of formation. We have doers and coffee cups. We have drawers full of different metals. We have 64 different metals that they can measure the heat capacity. So let's say that they wanted to measure the heat capacity. I'll drag out my coffee cup, drag out my metal. I pull this down here, turn on my thermometer, turn on my stirring, take my lid off. You know, maybe I'd go add 100 mils of water from a graduated cylinder and um, add that. So now I have water. This indicates my water level. I could calibrate my calorimeter if I wanted to using an electrical heater. You don't have to. So I could turn on graph, graph my data. So let's say that I, let's pretend that I wanted to measure the heat capacity of cesium. Here's my balance. I put on some weight paper. Weight paper weighs differently every time. Go put on my cesium. There's my cesium. Here's my mass. I then open my oven, control the temperature of my oven, put my cesium inside, heat it up, and then I would drop it. And this is what happens when you put cesium in water. So students like to find how these things blow up. Um, so we can do combustion, heats of solution, Hess's law, you know, comparing entropy and enthalpies, 
So here's an example, heat of solution of sodium nitrate, for example. It really baffles students. Why is this thing cooling when I add a salt? And so we talk about Gibbs free energy, enthalpies, uh, entropy, that this is an entropically driven process because the crystal is going to be, is going from a ordered to a disordered um, state. Um, heats, of, heats of reactions, um, you can do boiling point, freezing point, depressions, elevations, um, and, um, and you can do heat diffusion of water. So lots of different experiments um, to do in calorimetry. So any questions? I think I've done a really whirlwind tour of three of the products. So. Let me know if you have any questions. In, let's dive into molecular bio because we said we were going to do that and we haven't gotten there yet. Oh, good. Yes. Okay. So they want to see molecular? Yeah. Sorry, that took a long time to get to. I, for, I was not on, I had forgotten about that. So my apologies. Specific so, someone said. Okay. Yes. So um, we have these five different benches in biology that do microscopy, genetics, molecular ecology. So the whole idea in, in this lab is we have a virtual world full of about 175 species that have genomes, genetics, 3,500 images. You can have them kill each other in ecology and eat each other and see how their populations change. But, um, but in this particular lab, the, the whole idea is to amplify certain genes. And so here is our species selector, and we can pick different genes that we want, I mean, different species, and pick a, um, make an effort or epinorph tube, and then um, take a DNA and add some DNA sample to that epinorph, and then um, add all the necessary materials like your TAC, your nucleotides, um, and then you can click here on primers, and then you have to pick the right primers, for the right genes and, and go do that and then add it to PCR. So the whole idea here though is, I'm just gonna show you a preset where we have already added everything we need for the fruit fly and the house fly ND1 gene. So this is presets done. I'll open my, my PCR and I'm going to add my, you can add up to eight of these, close out, I'm gonna click Here's my PCR controller so I can change my PCR temperatures, dwell times, number of cycles. I click run or click my play button. So now the PCR is gonna go through its three day, three hour sequence, but I'm just gonna come down here and advance it. Uh, we also have animations that show the different steps. They wanted to see what's actually going on at a molecular level. So now I'm done. So how do I know that I actually amplified it? I pick up my, my pipette and then I'd come over here to my gel and I drop it on one of, the, one of the channels here. I'll drop the other one. And now I'm gonna click on my gel here and you can see the gel. Turn on the power supply. You can control how long it runs, what voltage to apply, change the polarity of the electrodes. So now I'm going to click and go on. Then now that it's on and you can see, I'm just going to advance my time that I'm going to go through here for 10 minutes and um, go through my, so now it automatically turns off after 10 minutes. So there's my, my uh, um, samples. Now I can turn on my UV light. I could save this to the lab book. And now I've done the gel and proven that I've actually amplified it. I can go here to kind of get an estimate of how many base pairs were amplified. And then what I could do is open my, um, I gotta close this because it's in the way. Um, I can now come over here and um, um, drop them into my sequencer and then close this open my sequencer here and press start. And again, I could advance my time and start seeing the, 
the sequence has come off with their chromatograms. I'm going to go show you a preset of what it does at the end. So at the end, you get both sequences, and you can click on it and save these to the lab book. Click on this one, save it to the lab book, open the lab book here, and now you've got your two sequences, which you can then copy and paste and analyze, copy it out to and analyze it at some other different formats and analyze it offsite on, you know, on some web page. So that's how the molecular works. Anything else? Feel free to unmute and ask anyone. Well, we are um, thankful that you joined us and there's so much interest in the labs and feel free to reach out for us and ask questions and... Um, Brian, do we do anything with plasmids? With what? With plasmids? I don't know enough biology to answer that question. Um, I don't think so. I'm not a biologist either. I mean, unless you think I did this, this, you know, my collaborators on biology were Keith Crandall, who's at, um, It's a recombinant DNA. Both of us are so clueless. <laughs> Sorry, physicist and chemist together don't know. No, uh, I don't think no, we do. I don't think there are plasmids in there. No. Okay. Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs> No, uh, but, but you know, um, Keith Crandall, who's at uh, uh, University, uh, Washington University in DC and Riley Nelson here at BYU were my co-authors on biology. So the whole idea behind biology, just so you know, was what's modern biology? Really modern biology is really looking at diversity and looking at it through the lenses of microscopy through genetics, through molecular biology, and through ecology, and looking at systematics, and then organizing the species you see based on that kind of experiments. And so, yes, there's a lot of experiments we don't have in biology, but it was to really teach students, you know, in general biology classes, a flavor of what modern biology really is. So that's, what, that's why we developed it this way. Any other questions? All right, feel free to contact us. Um, we'll post this um, webinar Wait, up in the next few more. days. Oh, one more. Someone said, can you show the biology opening screen again? What else would you like to see? I can show you kind of microscopy. Here's the microscopy. So if I come down here to say, Paramecium, I can show videos of a compound scope of paramecium, right? And I can also come over here to an SEM microscope. So we took all these images. Um, so SEM micrographs, different magnifications. Um, so that's kind of what microscopy does. Genetics. Genetics allows you to pick a species like a fruit fly and pick, say, um, these different traits like head shape or multiple traits. You can select the genotype for the parents. They randomize and do a cross. And then you see the statistics of, of what you get and see the individual outcomes for the male. So there's one with a head with a leg sticking out of the head. There's a female without, there's a male with one, female without, male without, and so on. Population genetics we can do. And then, like I said, in ecology, let students define biomes and pick species, put them out. So here's a preset of, say, wolf and an elk in a temperate deciduous forest. And then you click play, and then we would start tracking their population as a function of time as a function of what the wolves are doing, what the elk are doing, and, and track that. So that's a super brief overview. Anything else? Well, I'm gonna sign off and thank you for coming. I think we're gonna do two of these next week as well on Tuesday and Friday if you want to join us again and ask more questions after you explore 
but um, thank you. Um, thank you for coming and um, hope to hear from you. Goodbye.